All right. Um, so welcome to the session. Uh, the, I think it's the fourth tutorial, um, Privacy at Scale, Local Differential Privacy in Practice. And uh, the tutorial has many co-authors, but here there will be three presenters, right? the ones who are indicated in red. Um, <clears throat> I'm Divish. And we'll have Tianhao talk after me, and then Graham towards the end. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> here are the aims of the tutorial that we have. And um, local differential privacy, in some ways, is a very recent model of privacy. So part of our aim is to introduce people to local differential privacy, right? provide some understanding of you know, the basic techniques, how it scales. Um, also, how it's been used in practice, right? And you'll see that among the different, you know, approaches for different, like differential privacy and local differential privacy, the local variant has been used a lot more, right, in practice. Um, given the kind of uh, deployments that we have seen, right, and the kind of core techniques that are needed for those deployments, there has been significant work in the research literature extending those techniques. Right? So the idea is to sort of bring connections between what has been done in the research literature right, with what has been used in the deployments and how can we improve that. And so just a lot of interesting directions for future work right? that so that the community can work on that. <clears throat> so this is the outline. The first module is going to be before lunch. Right? And it's about an hour and a half. Um, we'll spend about 45 minutes talking about the preliminaries and the state of the art deployments. Uh, and I'll do the first two sessions here, the first two uh, things. And then Tianhe will take over and talk about some theoretical foundations as well as this basic primitive called the frequency oracle, right? And this frequency oracle will be, you'll see it will be used in all the deployments, right, that people have so far. Um, after lunch, right, we'll talk more about applications, right? Things like heavy hitters, item set mining, marginals, graphs, location. So Tianha will talk about this and then Graham will conclude right with all of these things. Okay, so you know it's a tutorial, right? So the interest the basic idea is you know to improve understanding. Right? So if you have questions, do ask any time. Don't feel obliged to wait until the end. Right? And Graham is here so he can answer all the questions. Actually, before I start with this, how many people here know differential privacy already? Okay, that's good. How many people here have come to learn about both differential privacy and local differential privacy? Some people. Okay. Okay, so, you know, um, just in some initial motivation about why privacy itself is important, right? So, over the last, I don't know, I would say almost 20 years, every so often you keep hearing horror stories about things that have happened because people have not quite done their data release properly or given what data has been released, people have been able to reverse engineer things that have privacy consequences. Right? So the most recent one that I know about, and maybe there's something in the last few months, is earlier this year in January, right, uh, there's a fitness tracker right, and, and they release the data. Right? Not identifying individuals or anything, but it had geo information on it. Right? So as a result of which people were able to sort of identify the location of military bases like in Afghanistan. Right? Because the military people use this. Right? And so you can use the heat map from there to sort of figure out where things are. Um, about three or four years back, there was an incident where the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission released a lot of taxi cab data. Right? Just simply things like, you know, where and when did pickups happen, where and when did, you know, were they dropped off, right? And there was, a, felt that there was no privacy risks to that. It was used in a lot of very interesting ways, right? But then you can sort of combine it with, you know, paparazzi style photos of, of people as well as sensitive locations and who gets dropped off or picked up at sensitive locations. And that caused a lot of privacy concerns. Um, about 10 years back, right, there were sort of privacy issues with the AOL data release, if you remember, there was an issue about the New York Times sort of identifying an AOL searcher. Uh, around the same time, you know, there was a Netflix issue, people released that. And if, you know, so you can see what happens is people release data with the in intent that it will be used in a, in sort of a researchy way, in a productive way to do useful things. Um, and bad things happen, 
right? So 20 years back, which sort of started the whole field of privacy research as we know it now, right, was an issue involving uh, correlating data between the group, health the group Health Insurance Commission and some public voter registration records, right? So of these things, do people sort of know most of the stories, have heard most of the stories? Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I don't plan to repeat these stories, but, you know, they're very interesting things. So if you're interested, come talk to any of us afterwards. <clears throat> so you might wonder with all these data release horror stories, right, you know, the horror is that sometimes the users get their privacy affected, but also there's a horror in that, you know, people with the best of intentions of releasing the data, right, often lose their jobs, entire groups get closed down, right, because of the consequence, you know, the bad publicity. So you might think with all of this, why do you want to release data in the first place, right? And I think it's useful to sort of observe that there's a lot of things that happen today, for instance, in medical research. Right? That happens only because there is data about patients that get released in some anonymized form, right? so that the privacy is not violated. But without data release, a lot of things, a lot of interesting uses, the utility will not happen. So just as one concrete example, <clears throat> and this is sort of close to heart because this particular uh, application was done using AT&T data that was released, right? I'm from AT&T. Um, so as you know that, you know, uh, there's a lot of congestion on today's roads, right? And people want to use data to try to understand how to do better urban mobility, how to devise better ways to, you know, go through traffic and so on. So this is an area, um, anybody know where this might be? Bay area. Bay area, yeah. So this is San Francisco up here, right? This is the Bay, this is San Jose down here. Um, the, you know, people who have been there know it's a very crowded area. Right, so earlier they would do things like put sensors under roads, right, and count the amount of cars going over it to understand how much traffic was there. But those sensors wear out over time, right? So the California Department of Transportation wanted to seek help from, you know, companies like AT&T to say, hey, you know, people carry mobile phones. Even when you're not, not on the phone, it's communicating with cell towers. So looking at, you know, sort of these signals, you can sort of get an idea of the traffic movement how much, when, where, where do people come from, where do people go. And it's fine, even if you don't know down to the GPS location, but only at the cell tower location, this is still fine, right? So people use an anonymized version, a differentially private version of this data to help the California Department of Transportation, right? And our lawyers being ultra conservative, we never release the data to the wide public, but only in a very targeted setting, right? So that's why you have not heard about any bad news in the media about anybody getting fired because of this. Um, but the data that was used, you know, you could sort of show that it was of high quality, it matched, you know, existing results, and it was very useful in practice. So this is the kind of reason why you would like to release data, but also make sure that um, to protect privacy, okay? So that was an example, but more generally, we have all been sort of hearing about big data, Right, and part of the reason is that big data is valuable because it's expected to solve a lot of interesting problems, right? Uh, you know, uh, you see big data everywhere, but an important thing to remember is that a lot of times, very often, this data comes from individuals, right? It could be location data, it could be medical health data, right? It could be use of devices, right? But all of this data comes from people, and people ultimately want to make sure that their data, right, does not hurt them, right? People don't misuse the data, so they want privacy for themselves, but they're happy if the data in the aggregate gets used for the common good, all right? <clears throat> and but given the, how sensitive the data is, the question is, you know, how can we use it, right? Of course, the easy answer, that you might expect or you might hope is that you can just anonymize the data, release it, and then get done with it. You know, just the previous horror story should have tell you that it's not easy, right? But just to give you a sense of what have people tr been trying to do and why is it not easy, right? Um, I want to just give you sort of a quick summary of the kinds of things that people have done over a long period of time since the late 1990s to try to solve the anonymization problem with data, right, and why it's not been successful. Okay. 
So before I go into this just from the motivation point of view any questions? People are okay with that? All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to present this particular you know sort of history as almost like a cat and mouse game. People know sort of Tom and Jerry the cartoon? Yeah. So it's sort of you know sort of the same approach. So what happened is that let's say I would say before 1997 Right? There was a very simple way that people had adopted for releasing private data, such as medical data and so on. They would look at fields of the data which they thought were identifiers, uniquely identifying some individual, some user, you know, your social security number, okay, maybe your driver's license number, credit card numbers, and they would somehow mask it. Okay, either completely hide it or if they want to do some kind of longitudinal analysis over time, they would hash it. So you could sort of still do joins over time. Okay, and then they would release that data and say, go play with it. Okay, in, in many cases, like for instance with medical record data, even though you hide the identifiers, it was still important to keep around things like demographic information. Right? When were people born? You know, their, uh, where do they live? Right? Uh, the ethnicity, the gender, because very often you would like to correlate how diseases evolve, how treatments affect people in terms of their correlation with their demographics, because then you can target treatments to specific groups of people. Right? So in these kind of situations, you had the information about people's often their birth, date of birth, right? as I said, gender, ethnicity, a lot of things, right? each of which in isolation was not identifying, right? Many people are born on the same day, right? Of course, lots of people have the same gender, right? People live in the same area, right? But, you know, as database people, right, we should know that, you know, joint keys don't have to be just single column, right? So you can often combine information, right, that each of which is not identifying in isolation, but together it becomes identifying, right? So in 1997, Right? Latanya Sweeney, then at MIT, carried out this so-called linking attack, right? which was the story of the group health insurance. And what she did basically was to observe that by combining information like demographic features like date of birth, gender, right? and uh, zip code, right? she could join that information with some publicly available data, which were the voter registration records. Right? and found that she could identify a large fraction of people. And in particular, at that particular instant, she actually found all the medical records of the then governor of Massachusetts, William Weld, right? and showed how easy it was to combine this anonymized data with public data. Right? And so that became sort of a, a vehicle, if you will, to jumpstart privacy research beyond that point. Okay? And so shortly thereafter, Right? Latanya Sweeney and, and Peranjala Samarthi proposed the K-anonymity model. The idea being that you want to be able to um, generalize people's you know, demographic attributes in a way such that 5, 10, at least a, a significant number of people have the same demographic attributes so you couldn't do the same kind of linking attack right? that prompted the problem in the first place. And this was fine for a few years. Right? Until around 2006, people started discovering attacks against key anonymity. Right? And that led to whole alphabet soup, right? L-diversity. People had an attack against L-diversity, T-closeness, M-invariance. Right? At some point, I think they may have run out of you know, the Latin alphabet. So there were some Greek names in there as well. Okay? But this kind of thing went on for a while. Um, I think a, a reasonable place where this sort of people in the community realized that these syntactic approaches did not work very well was around 2009 when Dan Kiefer published this work showing that you can use machine learning techniques right, to attack some of these syntactic anonymization techniques. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that <clears throat> it was not that these techniques, <clears throat> this machine learning technique necessarily revealed Right? or violated the privacy of any particular person and saying, here in this data set, this is the wish. Right? What they did was to increase the, the likelihood right? that it was the wish. So for instance, if you did k anonymity with k equals 10, your expectation was that the likelihood that it was you was 1 over 10. Right? But if using machine learning techniques, I can 
increase that to 1 over 5, it's still not definitively identifying me. But what it says is the more and more information I collect and I keep increasing the probability, eventually I might sort of, you know, reveal that this is Devesh with high enough probability that it might then be a privacy concern. Okay, so this might seem like an end of the road for privacy research, except that fortunately, just a few years before that, uh, Cynthia Dwork, right, um, I think she was at IBM at that point, I don't remember, Microsoft at that, in 2006. Um, so she came up with this notion of differential privacy, which is a semantic definition of privacy. Okay, so we'll spend a few slides uh, just to give you an idea of differential privacy, but the purpose of this tutorial is not differential privacy per se, but a particular starting called local differential privacy, but I think it's worth just understanding the key ideas of differential privacy. All right? Okay. Um, before we get into, you know, any of the math, any of the comparisons, anything, right? The basic idea that I would like you to take away both about differential privacy and later on about local differential privacy is this idea, this key concept which is saying, right, um, can I look at any of this data and, and have some notion called as plausible deniability. Okay, so plausible deniability sort of goes something like this. It says somebody looks at a data set and infers something, right? And that might seem like uh, it is revealing some private information about me, Devesh. Okay, and somebody says, you know, but I made this inference in such a way that whether or not you are present in the database, right, the inference that I make has very similar probability. Okay, so if I made an inference and you cannot even tell whether you are present in the database, then in what sense is it violating your privacy? Okay, so just keep that notion in mind because that's what is sort of out the basic notion here, so, right? So what differential privacy says that is you need a randomized algorithm. Okay, so no deterministic algorithm will work. You need a randomized algorithm and it satisfies differential privacy with this privacy parameter epsilon. If it turns out that given any two data sets, right, what they call neighboring databases in the differential privacy literature that differ by one individual. So imagine in one of them Devesh was present, other one Devesh was absent, right? Or maybe in one Devesh was present, in the other Graham was present. Okay, there are different variations of the same thing. Anything that I can infer for given any property S, right, because it's a randomized algorithm, the probability that this randomized algorithm on this data set satisfies this property, right, is very close to the probability that this randomized algorithm running on the neighboring data set satisfies the same property. Okay, and, and this, how much of this difference is given by this factor of e raised to epsilon, where epsilon is this privacy parameter. So think epsilon being close to zero, e raised to epsilon close to one, so the probabilities are very similar. Okay, when epsilon is larger, you're allowed to sort of differ by a much larger amount. Okay, so this gives you a sense of, you know, how this randomized algorithm is expected to do now. So notice, this is a semantic definition. Nobody tells you how to achieve it, right? Unlike the syntactic approaches like key anonymity and diversity, where people gave you this recipe, you do this, this, this on the data set, and that's exactly what is needed, right? But over the years, since 2006, it's been about a dozen years, right? People have come up with a very large number of approaches to come up with differentially private, you know, mechanisms, all right? So this is the basic idea. So give you the most simple example that makes sense for databases. Think of a, a database of individuals with certain set of properties that you care about. From that property, you create something like a histogram, okay? So the histogram says on a certain subset of dimensions, right, create some kind of thing which says for this combination of values, how many individuals satisfy this property? Okay, that's your multidimensional histogram, right? So now imagine in this multidimensional histogram, what happens if you go from one database to a neighboring database? So if a, in a database, you have some individual present, it had some combination of properties, he contributed a count of one to a particular cell, that individual is absent, the count can differ by one. 
right so in this kind of setting right if you want to be able to achieve epsilon differential privacy for this kind of count data right you just need to add a small amount of random noise and i'll tell you in my next slide how and how much right but intuitively if you were to add a count of plus or minus 1 0 plus or minus 1 right then to every cell in the database to every cell in this histogram then somebody looks at a cell in which which corresponds to let's say um, you know indians who emigrated to the united states 25 years or 30, whatever back right and and you say hey that looks like divesh that that's you right i said could be me but maybe it was because the, there was some noise added right so there is a plausible deniability that that particular cell even if it looks like something very specialized may not correspond to me because of the noise added Right? And it's equally the same way, right? It's not just the presence, sometimes the absence of an individual is sensitive, right? That's why you add this kind of noise, okay? And I've already talked to you about plausible deniability because of the uncertainty introduced due to this noise, right? So, for those of you who are already understand epsilon differential privacy, right? This slide sort of is doesn't add much value but if you're here just to understand some things right there are some notions that you will read about when you see papers on differential privacy so the main idea here is just to introduce you to some of that notation so that if you're interested and you read you know what it means right so one of the notions is sensitivity right there are many variants the simplest notion is global sensitivity and that's very important because it tells you that if you're trying to compute some function so as an example the count is a function the count of people who satisfy a property okay but it could be something like average salary could be any function that you have on a particular data set and sensitivity means if i were to remove an individual from the database how much or given any pair of neighboring databases how much can the value of this function change between a pair of neighboring data sets okay that gives you sort of the sensitivity right if you have a database which happens to have the net worth of individuals right you can imagine that adding or removing bill gates or jeff bezos will blow up the sensitivity right but if it's something that you're doing like count data right then no matter which individual you remove or add it only sort of affects the sensitivity by one right uh, so given the sensitivity as you can now imagine the idea is you want to add noise that is somehow proportional to the sensitivity okay if the sensitivity is low you can add a small amount of noise if the sensitivity is high you have to add a high amount of noise to hide the presence or absence of an individual from the database does that basic concept make sense? Okay. So one of the techniques, for instance, people have is you want to add, for instance, Laplacian noise, right, with a parameter which is epsilon divided by S. Okay, so if it has high sensitivity, you will end up adding a lot of noise. Okay, so this is what the Laplacian looks like, a discrete version of this is geometric, but this says with mean zero, you can add positive noise or negative noise right and if a count maybe you just add if sensitivity is one you might add plus or minus one with lower probability plus or minus two and so on okay but if it's a highly sensitive if you have high sensitivity you have to add a lot more noise okay um, there are some properties right that don't directly affect us right now but when you hear more about local differential privacy it will become again important is how do you compose things Okay. And there are notions like sequential and parallel composition in terms of how do you combine things and how it affects the privacy budget, right? Won't get into this right now here, but keep this in mind because when Tianhao and Graham talk about things, you know, some of these things will come back again. Okay. So this basic idea of epsilon differential privacy is in the centralized model, right? The centralized model effectively says that you know what happens if you give all your data all your trusted data to some third party and they you know could be a database owner and then if you ask questions again against that database owner they answer it by adding the right amount of noise but what if you don't trust this centralized party 
right? So the question is, the whole area of local differential privacy came about because people wanted to reduce the trust they have in some centralized data collector, data aggregator. In the worst, in the extreme case, you want to have zero trust. So most work on differential privacy assumes a trusted third party, but what happens if you want to reduce the amount of trust? Can you remove a trusted third party? So in this case, the basic idea is that individual users themselves produce some kind of locally private output. All right? And I'll give you examples of how this can be done. And then this gets aggregated to produce the answers. So instead of introducing noise at the aggregator stage, each individual user adds some noise as one possibility, there are other ways. So I'll just mention, for instance, that instead of doing, you know, adding noise, you could use some kind of homomorphic encryption. Okay, and then the idea is that, you know, the users are only sending out some kind of encrypted data, right? But you can compute a lot of different functions and queries by combining encrypted data directly instead of decrypting it. Right? Now, this tends to be very complex right now. It has a very high computational overhead, right? So this is why it's not practically feasible to do this right now. Okay, maybe eventually it might, right? Um, you know, it's shortly after we have world peace, right? I think this will become practical. Um, I'll talk more about local differential privacy, right? So since we just talked about differential privacy and how we can add noise, right, to achieve differential privacy, you might think, you know, maybe we can try running some kind of differential privacy on the output, on the data of each user, right, and then combine that. Um, this might seem crazy, right, you know, sort of, initially it worked because I had a lot of data, right, and added a small amount of noise, but if each user adds noise to mask their own input, then surely the noise will overwhelm the signal. Right? And sometimes that happens, right? But, you know, if you add the right kind of noise, right, sometimes the noise can cancel out if it was unbiased. But even if it was biased and you know how it was biased, you might be able to subtract out the noise. Right? So I'll give you an example in the next slide. But so you can end up with the true answer plus some amount of noise with a certain variance. Right? But what is important to keep is that even if you do this, the amount of noise is still substantially larger than what you see in the central differential privacy case. All right? Yeah, Lex, go ahead. In the worst case, yes, right? In terms of if you want to do variance, variances add up. So in expectation, the noise cancels out, right? But ultimately, you still end up with a larger variance, right? So the amount, you know, so the variance is what affects the accuracy, for instance. Okay, so as an example for this differential privacy, right, uh, you can have users with a zero one value and you want to estimate the total population count, some, something like that. Right, so you can add some amount of Laplace noise, right, and of course if n users add noise with this variance, variances add up, right, so your error, right, but you know, you can have confidence bounds about how close you can be likely to be to the true mean and so on, so it ends up that your error which is like the square root of the variance, right? Maybe more like this, right? While your true value may be some which is proportional to n, which is still fine in many cases as a numerical example. You know, if n is about a million, right? n by 2 is about 500k. Under this, you would add about this much amount of noise, introducing about 1% uncertainty, which doesn't sound too bad, right? Except in the centralized case, you're adding in a noise of proportional to 1, right? just one or two, and so the noise would be far lower there, right? Um, so as a general approach, you can do this, but the error typically scales with square root n, and the constants are somewhat high, right? So this approach, this generic approach, right, is something where uh, a lot of work needs to be done. So because of this, we need to design new kinds of LDP algorithms, okay, which have better accuracy, you know, cost guarantees in terms of space, time, communication. I'll show you how this is done. <clears throat> and I'll give you a few basic ideas, but a lot more work is something that Tian Hao and Graham will talk about after me. All right? So let me start with a very basic idea, All right? which might also seem like a very surprising idea in case people don't know about it. How many people here have heard about randomized response? Enough people. That's good. Right, so, 
Randomized response was a technique invented by statisticians, right, about 50 years back, right? So a guy called Warner, and I'll tell you what it was, a very simple idea. So even then, right, the statisticians were interested in sort of carrying out surveys, right? And not just asking simple questions, but asking questions which might be sensitive, right? Do you have a particular disease, right? Do you have a particular religious affiliation? And, and they very quickly realized that people don't always answer truthfully to surveys if you ask them to tell the truth. So Warner came up with this technique which has some very nice, elegant theoretical properties, right, where he sort of said, okay, I know you may not want to uh, you know, answer the question truthfully, but let's carry out a certain protocol. Okay, and the protocol goes something like this. Let's take a coin, right, head or tails, unbiased coin, toss it. If it comes heads, Tell me the truth. Okay, if it comes tails, toss that coin again. If it comes heads again, give me the truth, otherwise lie. Okay, so if you get an answer from somebody, right, asking a question, right, which says, um, do you really care for pods papers? Right? And you get back an answer, yes. Right? Maybe he really does, right? but maybe you know, it just happened because he was lying. Right? Similarly, if he comes back false, it's not that he's like a, a, a pod's bigot. Right? It might just turn out that you know, he, maybe he is. Right? Or maybe you know, he really likes pod's papers, but the coin flips gave him this answer. Right? So this is kind of plausible deniability, right? which says, you know, you know, you have this answer, right? So the question now is, given these kind of answers, what can you do about it in the aggregate? And the basic intuition, right, I won't go through the math, is that you can collect responses from a sufficiently large number of users, and then unbiased, you can subtract the noise that's going on, and get a, a good, you know, sort of an unbiased estimate of the answer, right? And again, the amount of noise that you add per individual sort of scales as one over square root n. Okay, for n individuals, the total noise potentially adds up to the same square root n. But this basic idea, right, you can sort of see in this case, heads is reported with probability three quarters and tails with one quarter, right? So these sort of neighboring data sets, right, where the value of the individual differs, right, ends up giving you this epsilon parameter of about natural log three. You can change the probabilities and, and get epsilon as you like. Okay, so the interesting thing about this is that this basic idea of randomized response is actually at the heart of many of the techniques that have been deployed today about LDP. Right? Okay, so I'm going to go over um, a bunch of techniques in about the next 15 minutes, okay, 10 to 15 minutes. Right? The idea here is not to give you a deep sense of exactly what Microsoft or Google did or Apple did or Microsoft did, right? but to give you a high level sense of what kinds of problems they were trying to attack, what kinds of techniques they were using. But keep in mind that at the heart of it, all of these basic techniques sort of build on randomized response. Okay? So Google has in the Chrome browser to collect a variety of browsing statistics. You know, Apple sort of deployed this to collect a variety of things that you type, whether it's emojis or, or sort of new words. Microsoft Windows is trying to collect telemetry data over time. If there are people here from those companies, maybe they can tell us more, right? Um, but the interesting thing is because these are widely deployed here, they yield sort of very large amounts of data that's being collected under local differential privacy. Okay, I think I want to stress that it's not that every single piece of data collected by any of these companies is being collected under the LDP model, right? Only some amount of data right now, right? Maybe they're experimenting to see how well it works before they expand, right? Or maybe it doesn't work for them, then they'll scale back. We'll see. All right? So I'm going to, the, the way I'm going to structure is I'm going to spend about five minutes very quickly on each of these, giving you an idea of what they want to do, Right? Why do they need to extend basic randomized response? How do, how do they do it? Okay? And then just keep these in mind because you know, both Tian Hao and Graham will go much deeper into techniques right, on how to build on this. Okay. Um, this is just worth keeping in mind. Right? 
you know, randomized response was invented about five decades back, right? And five decades later, local differential privacy is now state of the art, right? So statisticians know something. All right, so here's what Google's rapport system does. So what they're interested in, for example, is what's your favorite URL? What's your homepage URL, okay? But they don't want sort of all that data, the raw data hitting their servers. Okay, so they're trying to sort of say, um, I would like to get an idea of, you know, what is the distribution, right? Uh, if this changes over time and so on. Um, now, if each user has one value in this case, for instance, you know, let's say New York Times out of millions of possible values, the question is, how do you do this? <coughs> there is an approach which is a called generalized randomized response. I won't talk about it. Tianha will talk about it. I'll give you one way of doing this, for instance, is to say, you create some kind of a sparse binary vector, right, where the size of the binary vector corresponds to all possible URLs, right? And, and an individual has one bit set in this enormous sparse binary vector. Okay, and you do randomized response for each one of them, as we just talked about, right? And if you get information from enough users, hundreds of millions is enough users, you'll be able to figure out right, which ones are truly popular, and so on. Okay, but as you can imagine, you know, while this satisfies some kind of LDP, and this, the reason of this parameter is because if somebody's favorite URL changes, it only affects two bits in the sparse random vector. Um, this is both very slow, a lot of work needs to be done, right, on each bit, and a lot of data needs to be communicated. Right, so the question is, how do you deal with this, and what um, rapport does is to try to reduce the amount of data that's what the comp computation as well as the communication by employing bloom filters. Okay, I'm assuming that people sort of know bloom filters in general, right? But the basic idea here is to, it's uh, a data structure to compactly encode set membership, right? And you apply multiple hash functions to map a value to more than one bit to increase the confidence. Right? So there is a standard properties of Bloom filters. You can update it. You can query it. Okay? The interesting thing, of course, is that you can now combine the idea of Bloom filters with some kind of randomized response. Okay? So instead of taking that sparse binary vector, you have a Bloom filter. You map your chosen URL to some you know, particular set of values there. Right, under some hash functions, and then you perturb the bits in the Bloom filter. Okay? Won't go again through all the math, but by doing all this, you can get you know, good privacy guarantees, right? and you can combine the information that you get from multiple users, add them up to get some idea of counts, probabilities, whatever you want to compute. Okay? And if you do this, you can actually decode the noisy counting Bloom filters as well, Right, because now you can sort of normalize the sum that you got from all the users in terms of a probability. Right? And using that, you can now estimate the frequency of a particular value. Again, this will work provided every user has the same probability right, of using randomized response. If each one chooses their own random probability, it's not that easy. Right? Uh, there are other techniques that have been proposed, for instance, you know, this also allows, by the way, to add new possible uh, domains that show up, right, because you're just mapping it to the same Bloom filter, right? Uh, you can also sort of build up domains by using sort of them as not as atomic values, but as strings that you can, you know, sort of decode sort of character by character or, or n-gram by n-gram. So there's a lot of interesting things to be done here, right? The reason I'm not talking about this too much is because I think the approach that's used by Apple, right, which is based on sketches, not so much on, on bloom filters, is actually a better, more principled technique. Okay, and I'll come to that in about two minutes. Right, so quickly summarizing rapport, right, it was implemented in the Chrome browser, it collects data from opt-in users. I think the most interesting thing about this is an open source implementation is available. Right, so if people want to take that open source implementation, right, for their own research, try to build on it, and so on, right, then that gives us sort of a place to start to do interesting empirical research with local differential privacy. Okay, so they, you can track all kinds of settings, and, and they did this, right, at this point, all of these details are not important, it's just good to know that it was deployed, 
They collected data. I don't have personal evidence of how successful it has been, right? Or how, you know, but that's something that you can talk. I wish I'd given this tutorial yesterday so you could talk about it at the Google reception, right? So, um, moving on. <clears throat> Apple wanted to solve a very similar kind of problem, right? Uh, you want to be able to count frequencies. Remember, in the context of Google's report, they want to count frequencies, right? Of how often certain, you know, what's your favorite URL? So in this case, you want to count frequencies. I think their original motivation is in terms of what is it that people type, what emojis do people use, and so on, right? We'll come to that. Um, again, you can assume for simplicity that in this case, each user sort of does some old single item, right? And what can you do in a way that's principled? Right? So instead of using Bloom filters, they use this thing called sketches, in particular something called as the count min sketch that I'll talk about. Right? It's better suited to capturing frequencies than Bloom filters. Bloom filters was originally designed to capture said membership. By doing counting Bloom filters, right? you can capture some idea of frequencies, but it was not really sort of the best suited thing. Right? These sketches are much better suited for that. So the count min sketch. Right, this CM doesn't stand for Countman, it stands for Graham Kormod and Muthu Krishnan, right, who are right here. Right, so um, the way the idea works is you can think of your sketch as some kind of a two-dimensional array. Right, you can think of this in you know, each, it's a D rows, where each of the rows corresponds to a different hash function that you want to apply. Right, and you can think of each of these as some kind of a, you know, sort of a, a compact representation where a hash function will map your value to one bit position, one position. Okay, um, and you want to sort of model your data as this sparse uh, frequency. You know, you have an original sparse frequency vector, and you create a small sketch. In the next slide, I'll just give you a quick idea of how this is updated, queried, and so on. All right. So this is, your, this is your, your, your count pin sketch, and the idea is that whenever you have a particular value, right, in a, in a sparse representation, take that value and decide which, you know, you take your hash function and decide where in this vector does it map to. And if you want to add some count, you add it to each under different hash functions. Right? Now, there can be collisions, right, that can happen. Right? But what was shown was that if you want to query what is the value of a particular item, right? and may, notice many people can be adding right, the same item, right? what you do is you take under all possible hash functions what is the location, what is the values here, and you take the minimum of those values, and that gives you a good estimate for right, the true count. So notice this explicitly deals with counts. There is no sort of collision in the same space like Bloom filters did, right? And, and it gives you a good way of estimating these things. And it has nice properties that you can merge things and so on, right? Which will be very useful for when you combine information from multiple users, right? But now if you want to have privacy, you want to combine this idea of the count min sketch with some notion of randomized response. Right, so in this case, each user encodes their unit input in the sketch and adds and does randomized response. Right, but if you're adding random noise, then it turns out that when you want to unbias, right, instead of using min, it's better to use mean because you have noise for each one of them. Luckily, it's still CM sketch. It's not count mean, not count min. All right. Um, and so you can do this. What you can show is that in this case, the error that you get is again sort of the absolute error decreases like 1 over square root n. Right? And I think this sort of works well in practice. Again, you know, because we have one of the authors of CM Sketch right here, if you have questions, ask him. If you don't have questions, invent one and ask him right here. Okay? Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that if you want a higher accuracy, typically you would add more hash functions. Right? But adding more hash functions both means more computation and a lot more communication. So the question is, how do you reduce the communication, especially if this communication is happening before, let's say, between your mobile device, which is doing all this computation locally right, for Apple, and, and some centralized server, which is this untrusted aggregator. Right? So again, the idea here is that uh, while the CM sketch is, 
is great for doing all of this. If you don't communicate the entire sketch, you might actually lose information. Right? And by using something called as a Hadamard transform, <coughs> which is some kind of a discrete Fourier transform, okay, over your, um, you can use this to essentially spread out your signal. Right? You can notice there are lots of ones and minus ones all over the place. You can spread out your signal and then just sample a small amount of information. In fact, one bit is enough. And that's what you need to communicate to the, the untrusted aggregator. Okay? You'll hear more about Hadamard transform later in the tutorial as well. Okay, but you can end up with low communication here because you, know, you will not miss it by sampling because of this particular Hadamard transformation. The information that is there, the signal, has been spread out everywhere. So there's a lot of redundant information right, in the result. Okay, and of course, the aggregator can invert the transform. So in practice, you know, they use it to collect information about what were popular emojis, how this changes over time. Uh, are there new words showing up? Right? Um, you can also learn other kinds of things about websites right, based on this kind of information. Um, the deployed in practice, one of the biggest criticisms they got was that under their deployment, they had sort of a very large value of epsilon, this privacy budget, right? which essentially means that you know, the users don't actually have too much privacy in practice. The third thing I just want to highlight very quickly again is that LDP is also used, has been used for, by Microsoft, right, for collecting telemetry data. And, and their explicit interest was to sort of understand temporal behavior. How much time do you spend on an application? Find patterns over time, right? And the questions they are interested in answering are still very similar. They have a, a few different approaches. I'll just quickly give you a sense of a couple of these things, right? But again, it's been implemented in Windows since 2017. Okay, and I'll just give you a summary at the end. So here's sort of one problem you might look at. Suppose you have a user, okay, who has some value, f, between 0 and 1, some real value. And you want to sort of estimate the mean across all the users. Okay, it looks like a slightly different problem from the categorical thing that randomized response deals with. What the approach was that, you know, simple approaches like building histograms and doing counting, you know, you get into questions like what the bucket boundary is, right? You know, you have sort of different errors there. So the approach they used was sort of a modification of randomized response. And the idea is that the user basically outputs, you know, a zero or a one. Okay? And you do this with this kind of a probability. Okay, so you can just think of it as following, you know, even though you have a, the value that a user holds is a real value between 0 and 1, you can just think of it as whatever that value is between 0 and 1 with probability f, right, you want randomized response to behave like it was 1, right, and with probability 1 minus f as if the user held 0. Okay, and so this is what this formula effectively achieves, right? Again, you can sort of show what kind of errors do you have here. Okay, so in addition to this problem, they are also interested in doing frequencies, right? Remember, frequencies comes back over and over again, the same kind of problem. So the, the basic, uh, you know, additional idea they had was that instead of doing randomized response for every bucket, you want to sample a subset of buckets, right? D buckets out of K, right? And if you use that, there is some kind of a trade-off that you get between error and speed. Okay, because you're only communicating information about D buckets, but your error is now proportional to square root of K over D. The smaller the number of buckets, the less the communication, more the error. Right? If you're taking all the buckets, you have lower error, but much more communication. Okay, and there are many alternatives, and you know, Tianha will talk about that next. Right? I won't get into memoization or output perturbation, right? but in practice, right, it's been deployed. These are the parameters they have used, and it collects data on a lot of different kinds of app usage over time. Okay, so I think I sort of overshot by a few minutes, uh, five minutes. Um, so we'll take questions on this later. We can talk to me over lunch, right? But I'd like Tian Hao to take over now and tell us about both what the formal foundations are for local differential privacy, as well as talk about before lunch this idea of the frequency oracle, right? Which is something that all the different deployments used. And in addition to what was actually deployed, what does the research literature tell us about that? Okay, so thank you. Tian, how are you?
should I just publish? And let's hope it has all your changes. Yes, so should I uh, point to the... Uh, you have to point to this? No. This file only, right? I mean, they can't find the... Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, Tianhao reminds me that all the slides, right, that we have been talking about, or some approximation thereof, is actually available at this site. So if people want to, you know, click on that, you can follow along the actual slides, right, as well. So... If you didn't take a picture too late, privacy considerations, it's gone. No, it's not. You can still take a picture. Yes. Hello. So Tianhao will talk about Part B, and then Graham will talk about Part B. Hello. Yeah, okay. So uh, my name is Tianhao Wang from uh, Purdue University. Now I'm going to present this uh, Part B of uh, uh, this uh, tutorial. And uh, first of all, I will uh, go into the uh, formal definition, uh, which uh, I think Devash has already uh, gone through a little bit. And then I will go to the frequency oracle, which uh, uh, basically gives the uh, estimate of the distribution of the underlying um, um, domain. And after that, we will have lunch, and uh, uh, and then I will uh, brief briefly uh, talk about how to uh, do heavy heater identification, and also the uh, frequent atom set mining and. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, website where you can download the uh, slides. And uh, now let's move on. So first of all, uh, the formal definition of uh, differential privacy gives that uh, a randomized algorithm A satisfies epsilon uh, differential privacy if and only for, for any two neighboring data set, D and D prime, the, uh, there is a ratio, there is a bound. Uh, whatever the neighboring uh, means. And uh, for the local uh, different privacy, we also have a very similar definition that says uh, the algorithm A will satisfy uh, epsilon local different privacy if uh, for any two possible values, x and I, x prime, and for any output y, uh, there is also a similar bound. And notice that there are differences. First of all, this algorithm A is run by the server. On the other hand, the algorithm A in the local setting is run by each user. And the second difference is that in the centralized setting, we have the neighboring data set concept. But in the lo local setting, we, we, we no longer have that because uh, each user has only uh, one value and we need to bound uh, for any possible values the, this uh, bound holds. Um, and note that here we also call the epsilon uh, parameter uh, privacy budget, and uh, the smaller the privacy budget, the, the better the, uh, the, the privacy guarantee for, for everyone. And uh, the idea or the intuition behind DP is that, uh, um, I think Devesh has also uh, talked about, is that uh, any output should uh, look, look similar no matter whether I'm in the database or I'm not. And uh, in the local setting, uh, we also have kind of a similar idea that is uh, any output should also be similar no matter uh, whether my secret is this value or that value. Yeah, so uh, giving the, the, uh, the definition, I will talk about some properties. And uh, Devash has uh, like go, go over 
briefly, but I will go into uh, deeper. It's a kind of like a reinforcement learning thing, but uh, I will not give you a reward for, for the previous understanding. Uh, yeah, so uh, there are basically three uh, nice properties of uh, different privacy. First of all, uh, first of all uh, the post-processing is, uh, is free. That means after you getting the uh, result of the algorithm A, uh, after you get uh, whatever the result, you can do whatever uh, further processing of the result, which does not consume any uh, further privacy budget. And second one is uh, called uh, parallel composition. That means uh, uh, you can divide the database into subsets and uh, apply epsilon i different privacy uh, algorithms to each of them. And the result will satisfy a maximum of the uh, epsilon i uh, different privacy. And uh, I think it's uh, not very hard to prove this. If we uh, take two uh, data sets, d and d prime, differ in only one tuple where the maximum uh, epsilon i DP algorithm is applied. So, so the two will differ in the partition where this max is applied. And the third one is uh, sequential composition. That means after uh, applying K DP algorithm, the result will uh, be satisfied in the submission of uh, epsilon i uh, different privacy. And this is also not very hard, I guess. Uh, I don't know if you can walk through the, the, the definitions. It's uh, not very hard. But keep in mind that the sequential composition will, will, will be applied to uh, each a DP algorithm, the, the each DP algorithm will uh, also take the, the original database. But uh, the post-processing algorithm will not uh, take the original database. We, it, it will also only take the output, but not uh, the original database. So the question is, uh, what about uh, local different privacy? That, that that has also similar properties? It turns out, first of all, the post-processing is also free in the local setting. And uh, if we can somewhat uh, briefly go over the, the definition, it also holds. But, uh, but to me, at least, uh, there is no direct, uh, direct uh, parallel composition because each user only has one uh, data item. There is no partition. But uh, if we think about it in another way, if we can partition the users, so we have uh, like one million users, we partition them into groups and apply um, epsilon i LDP algorithms to each partition, each, each group of users, the result will satisfy. Uh, so for each, each user in each group, their privacy guarantee is, uh, is guaranteed by epsilon i uh, LDP. And finally, uh, there is also sequential composition uh, here, uh, which is uh, similar to the DP setting. And uh, yeah, so having understand the properties, we now look at uh, some uh, key differences, uh, which uh, Devash has also uh, go over. Yeah, so the, the key definition is that uh, DP concerns about two uh, data sets, but uh, LDP concerns any two values. So as a result, the amount of noise is different in the two settings. So if uh, we consider the counting query, the amount of noise in, in, in the DP setting is, uh, is constant because the sensitivity is constant. And after getting sensitivity, we add the Laplace noise, which is also somewhat constant. But in the local setting, it, even if uh, everyone's noise is still constant, but if we add them up, know that uh, uh, the variance will add up. Therefore, uh, if we use the standard deviation of the, the noise, uh, it will have a square root of n uh, factor here. And, uh, if we want to normalize the result uh, so, so that the result will fall into 0 to 1, <coughs> we will have uh, uh, 1 over n versus 1 over square root of n uh, noise amount. 
So there is a difference. Uh, there is a square root uh, difference here. Right? It's uh, kind of uh, very important if we uh, want to design algorithms. Yeah, so now I have gone through the uh, uh, definition, and uh, we will uh, go to the, the rest, which will be composed of, uh, first of all, we will look at the basic uh, mechanisms, which will be used to build uh, the LDP algorithms uh, on, on top of the basic algorithm. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, Graham and I will um, give you some uh, applications of this LDP algorithm. So first of all, uh, let's look at the most, one of the most basic uh, uh, tasks in LDP, which is uh, uh, frequency estimation. In this uh, kind of uh, uh, system model, we have uh, one centralized server, or we can also call it a trusted third party or aggregator, and we will exchange the, uh, use those three notions. And there are many users. Each user has a, a, a private value, and each user will, will add noise locally so that they, they, they do not need to trust anybody, do not need to trust uh, the third party. Or, or I should see the server is an untrusted third party here. Yes. And the goal here is to estimate the frequency of uh, each uh, value in the domain D. And we assume, uh, for now, the, the domain is uh, categorical. Right? So, so like, uh, how many uh, audience in this room are, are male or female or whatever? The, And uh, to, um, like, um, like analyze all those uh, uh, algorithms in a systematic way, we uh, propose a, a framework of uh, frequency oracles. So in this framework, each uh, user will uh, run two algorithms. The first one is uh, uh, encoding thing. So we, we present this encoding that's because we, it, it can be easily uh, re represented. It, it will make the presentation of other algorithms uh, easier. And then the, there is a perturb function which uh, is the key to satisfy uh, epsilon LDP. All right, so, so the uh, encode algorithm will take any value and output uh, some form of uh, encoding of this uh, value v, and uh, and then the the per perturb function will perturb the, the the encoded value. And after that, each user can uh, send this y, which we call the report, to the server, who will um, take the report from all users and uh, output. Uh, estimation of the distribution of any uh, possible value. So of course, the very first uh, LDP algorithm that satisfy uh, this uh, goal is a uh, randomized response. And uh, I will go quickly. And in this uh, setting, um, the, the surveyor will ask some question that might be sensitive. and each person will toss a secret coin and answer yes. If it comes up head, answer a randomly other question, uh, answer if it comes up head. So as a result, a patient will answer yes with a 75% probability. That's a half plus a quarter. And the nice thing about this is it provides uh, what we call the deniability. That means seeing the answer, no one is uh, sure about uh, your secret. Yeah, so this is uh, some further thing about uh, um, randomized response. Uh, so, so if we assume n sub v is the number of users that uh, will that had the value v, or uh, say number of patients here, we will expect it to see the yes answer, uh, which will be uh, given by i sub v. 
So the expectation will be 75% N sub V plus 25% of the other users, right? So expectation calculation. And uh, this uh, C of uh, V is uh, the uh, estimation function which will uh, get rid of the bias of the of the I sub V, which will, will be more clear later. Uh, yeah, so, so first of all, this uh, satisfies uh, law in three uh, LDP, because uh, if we take uh, this uh, ratio for any combinations, we, the maximum we can get is uh, three. And uh, yeah, so, so this only handles yes and no, but uh, uh, as we will show later, it can be easily extended to a more uh, general setting where we have uh, like many possible answers. Yeah, so, so this is a, a simple math example. So maybe if uh, you're not very uh, confident about randomized response, you can do a simple math here. So say, for example, the yes answer is 80 and no answer is 20. Then um, we expect it to see uh, 40 plus 20 yes answer, right? Because uh, if it comes up ahead, uh, it will give a 40 yes answer. And uh, if it comes up till uh, the other 40 users will answer randomly, it will give uh, 60. And from yes to no will be 20, right? The, the other 20 users. And from no, similarly, we have a five. We will have five yes answers and uh, fifteen no answers. And uh, note that this is our uh, uh, like uh, rescale function that that uh, linearly transform the uh, yes and no answers to to its unbiased estimation. So we. Now we have uh, observed uh, 65 yes answers and uh, 35 no answers. We, if we take this formula, we will get uh, the uh, estimated value, which is unbiased here. Hope this is uh, simple enough. Yeah, and uh, then uh, simple proofs. Uh, first of all, we want to show that uh, the apps, uh, the expectation is, uh, uh, is N sub V, which means the uh, estimation is unbiased. Note that we, we already have this uh, uh, rescale function, and we have this uh, uh, expectation uh, thing. And we can easily uh, prove that uh, this equals the, the final result, which is, uh, I guess, easy for and uh, yeah, so we will not prove for any further uh, frequency oracles, but uh, we see that it is uh, equally uh, easy for, uh, for other frequency oracles. And also the variance for other, uh, and also for this, we will not prove, but uh, it's uh, also kind of easy. And one, one more slide about uh, uh, this uh, probability uh, analysis is that uh, we, the goal is to compare the um, the estimation versus the true result, and uh, since we we already know that uh, C of V is a random variable because each user will random its value and then uh, randomize its value and then report. Uh, there are two steps in this analysis. First one is to show that is uh, unbiased. Another is to compute its variance. And uh, we see that uh, others are also free to use uh, error bound or whatever tools you are more familiar. But uh, uh, for now, we, we use variance because uh, uh, variance can be transformed to, to other error bound or whatever. Uh, because C of V is actually a, a binomial variable, it can be approximated by a, a normal distribution if uh, we have enough number of users. Yeah, so coming back from yes and no answer to, uh, to the previous slides where we want to generalize this uh, uh, protocol, 
Next, we will present uh, the uh, randomized, uh, uh, generalized randomized response, and uh, also another uh, kind of family of uh, function called the unary encoding uh, by, by the wrapper system, and another family using hash function. And uh, yeah, so this is a like service style paper that will summarize and uh, uh, systemize all those papers and uh, compare them and give a, a guideline as to what you want to use in, in, in different uh, situations, in different scenarios. That's so first of all, the randomized response uh, generalized version, we call it uh, uh, direct encoding for now. And uh, it is also uh, not very Hard, I would say. So the first uh, encode step will basically uh, do nothing, just uh, direct encoding, right? So, so we assume the value from, comes from a domain of one up to d, and small d is the, the domain size. Then the user will also toss a coin, but has uh, some bias. And if it comes up here, they report the true value, otherwise report uh, uh, just any other value instead of just uh, the, the wrong answer. So if we see that uh, the P is here, Q, Q is this one, the result will be uh, bounded by E to epsilon. Right. So. And similarly for the aggregation function, uh, we also have the similar uh, uh, expectation and the similar uh, uh, linear transformation that is unbiased and has some variance. And yeah, so intuitively, the higher the p, the more accurate the algorithm is, because the, the higher the p, the more likely I would uh, um, be uh, honest. Um, but as we may notice, this p value is uh, dependent on, on d. The, the larger the, the small d is, the, the better the result will be. And this table gives you us an uh, intuition of how large the p can be in large d uh, settings. So if uh, d is only 2, Epsilon is uh, 0 0.1, which I think is uh, typically used in the centralized setting of DP. The true, uh, the probability of being honest is uh, just over 50%. But if uh, P is, uh, uh, if D becomes larger and larger, we can see the uh, probability of being honest is, uh, is quite small. That, is the, that means the accuracy will be quite bad in some sense. And we, if we enlarge uh, epsilon, go up to four, which I think somewhat is uh, commonly used in some LDP deployments, uh, we can see the, the accuracy will, will, will go. So if we look at each column, the accuracy will be, uh, the p-value will be higher, but uh, Still, for the very large D size, the, the probability of P is, is quite uh, unacceptable. And uh, yeah, so to get rid of this uh, bad uh, dependency on D, we want to uh, move on to the unary encoding, uh, which uh, is it's, it's called uh, the basic wrapper in the wrapper paper, and the Diresh has also covered some ideas of the of this encoding thing. See that? So the idea is to encode the, the value into a standard uh, basis, basic vector. For example, if uh, we also have uh, uh, D possibilities and the private value is three, we, we can encode it into 0, 0, 1, 0. And then the server will perturb each bit uh, independently with uh, some probability p. Uh, preserve with probability p, preserve with uh, y minus p. So yeah, so preserve means uh, from one we still get one, and from zero we still get zero. 
and we li uh, we leave this uh, purposefully because we will move, uh, revisit this uh, later. And uh, so yeah, so so because for any uh, two different values, the uh, the distance between their unary encodings are at most uh, two. Therefore, we need to split privacy budget into uh, half half, and then perturb perturb uh, each bit. Uh, um, independently. So, so this uh, ratio, uh, if we uh, take it, uh, others will be canceled out. So it will only, it will only give uh, this one, which is uh, epsilon, e to epsilon. Yeah, so the intuition of uh, this unary encoding, I would say, is that um, by this unary encoding, the uh, D is in each location will be reduced from very large to only two, right? Zero or one in each location. But uh, there is a trade-off, that is the privacy budget is uh, halved for, for each location. So, so as a result, when D is uh, large, unary encoding will be better, as we'll see later. But when D is small, one, one better off to use the randomized response method. Yeah, and uh, to estimate the frequency of uh, each possible uh, value in the domain, we can just do it for uh, each uh, location. All right, so a uh, more concrete example is uh, there are, this is a server, that, and we have five users. Each user has some private value, two, two, three, two, four. And we assume the domain has only four uh, possibilities. Each user will first uh, encode its uh, private value into a bit vector. And uh, if we set this, uh, which we can also calculate uh, epsilon based on those uh, p and q, so each user will perturb uh, each bit uh, independently with uh, p and q values. So perturb with only 20% uh, probability. And each user will send uh, this bit vector, which might be large, to the server. And the server will first uh, aggregate the result. And then um, calculate this uh, linear uh, transformation and uh, get the result, uh, get the unbiased estimation. Yeah, so, so here we can see the uh, truth is uh, 0, 3, 1, 1, but uh, estimated the result will be uh, somewhat uh, different, right? That, that is, uh, I, I would say, mainly because we only have uh, five users. If we have a million users, the, the difference will be very small. So the relative difference will be small. So for those of you uh, familiar with the uh, centralized DP, you might also think about uh, applying uh, Laplace uh, noise to each uh, location because each location is also zero or one. One, one can also apply a Laplace mechanism or Gaussian. But uh, um, so for now, for now, I would say this is uh, worse than just applying randomized response. And uh, if you run run experiment or uh, calculate uh, the variance. Uh, carefully, you can also see that effect. So, so that means in the local setting, we're better off using uh, randomized response instead of uh, Laplace or Gaussian mechanisms. Yeah, so in the uh, USENIX paper uh, last year, we, um, we observed something uh, in this unary encoding thing. So, so remember that uh, previously we have this uh, probability p from 1 to 1 and the probability p from 0 to 0 are equal, right? And the 1 to 0 and 0 to 1 are also equal. Uh, but this can be different, right? There, there is no restriction that we, we must make them equal. And the uh, intuition is that uh, there are a lot more zeros than ones, right? So each perturbation will lose some information. But if we make this perturbation uh, lower for zeros because there are more zeros 
and higher for one because there is only one one. Like this. So from one to one is uh, purely random, and from one to zero is also purely random. But uh, from from zero to zero is uh, quite large compared to compared to this one, and from from zero to one is quite small. We can see that this also satisfies epsilon LDP, and it will give us a better uh, variance and better uh, uh, empirical result. I think I would uh, stop here. Uh, no, I will stop after this slide, and uh, I will go to lunch with you. And yeah, so. So the binary local hash uh, is presented in a stock paper uh, which uses uh, some shear randomized uh, matrix. And uh, now here we only present uh, some uh, equivalent in, uh, uh, description which might be easier to understand. So here the uh, encoding function is to hash the value to a smaller domain. Uh, so, so we use uh, g equals 2 means that the result will only, for example, take the last bit of the hashed uh, result of the value v. Right? So if we take uh, some random hash function like uh, char 2 and we take the last bit, which uh, might be random, so the user will, can then perturb the, this first bit the, or the last bit using randomized response. So because it only perturbed one bit, the perturb and preserve function uh, probability looks like these two values. And uh, still, if we check the uh, ratio of probabilities, we still get uh, e to epsilon. And then uh, the user can send this report. and. Uh, uh, and uh, the user must say what uh, hash function I am using to the server. Yeah, so the aggregator will increment the reporter group, uh, which will be clear in the uh, example I will show after launch. And we also have this uh, similar thing, which will also be clear after uh, the example I will show after launch. So. Be sure to come after lunch if you are curious about how this works. Yeah, so I may have several questions for several minutes for questions if you have, otherwise we can go to lunch. Like I'm gonna encourage people to thank you. <laughs> question and maybe I missed and you guys talked about this but um, when you get data from users you don't get it just once you get it multiple times over time so how is the temporality handled here do you consider these independent samples if so that just doesn't work right because user preferences don't change for example so how yeah. does this work yeah so so the question is uh, the users may report multiple times to the server right and so, yeah, so in this framework, uh, Frequency Oracle, we only consider user will report once. The user has only one value. For example, the user's password, which might not change. So I don't mean just Frequency Oracle. I mean just generally local differential privacy or even differential privacy. Yes. Right, because where we use these things are, you know, Apple and whatever, but the census as well. And the same questions apply there. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so. If you remember, we also talk about uh, uh, sequential per, uh, composition, which means that uh, if I collect twice, I, your privacy cost will be doubled. Right. But that is a terrible, terrible baseline. Yes. And that essentially means that you have to know ahead of time how many times you're going to collect this information. Yes. What do you do? It's a practical question. Yeah. Okay, I think we, we need to share the mic if this is going to go on the recording, so I'll, I'll borrow this. Is okay. that okay? Sure.
yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. Um, this is something, this is why this is sort of um, research in progress, I'd say. So some of the deployments we've talked about do consider this, this sort of sequential longitudinal study of data. And as you say, you, you, the simplest thing you can do is just treat it as sequential observations and apply composition results. And, and essentially what it says is naively your, your sort of privacy guarantee looks meaningless after a while. Um, so that's what Apple do. They basically say every day um, you're a brand new person, you get a fresh allocation of budget, uh, of privacy budget, and, and you kind of start over again. Um, the, the Google and the Microsoft deployments try to do try to do more sort of um, extra twists. This was some of the things uh, Devesh didn't have time to talk about, based on sort of re-randomization and, and um, um, output perturbation. But they're essentially heuristic. Um, so there's there's one paper from three months ago on archive that tries to say something more theoretical and more formal about this, and, and that's basically state of the art. So it's it's a wide, big, wide open open problem to really say something more sensible about giving a meaningful privacy guarantee over repeated data collection. Hmm? Um, it's, we mentioned it in the slides right at the end, or I think uh, is it it's um, John Ullman is one of the authors, but yeah. I mean, just to quick answer more about what, micro <coughs> what Microsoft's deployment does. <coughs> right, so I can go to the next slide. I think that's probably better, right, without perturbation. So here's one thing that it does, right, is... Um, so you know, there's a mecha there are two things they do, right? So one is if you keep randomizing the response, right? Then you're adding to the privacy budget. But if you memoize and you return the same value that you did before, right? Then you're repeating that. You're not adding new random noise, right? So you're not increasing the privacy budget there. So when there is change, right? So part of what they do is you know, they have this approach called memoization, which allows you to distinguish between change and no change. So it doesn't strictly preserve the, 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 you know, the LDP properties. But output perturbation, basically what it does is, whenever the user outputs something, they can, they can choose to flip that information with some probability as well. So what that does is, over a long enough period of time, if there is something that the user has with changes, you'll find out that it changes, but not exactly when does it change or what value changed. Right? So there are some heuristic approaches that are out there right now. And as Graham said, more principled ideas still need to be developed. Other questions? There's going to be more opportunities for questions during and after lunch as well. So. Let's go enjoy lunch now. Thank you.